Hello, hello. You can hear me really well. All right. <clears throat> hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. And we've been working for about the last 25 years. We've worked for every publisher in the business. And we've published somewhere around 100 books between all of us. And we've all taught illustration at the university. Each week, we're going to be coming at you guys with a different topic. And we are going to fight, scrap, and hug. And you're going to learn something each week. Cool. Or else. <laughs> or else. Or else we didn't do our job somehow. <laughs> One time we're finally going to do a podcast where people are like, yeah, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yesterday I was looking at our, our YouTube channel and I was reading mm-hmm. some of the comments and I, I absolutely just love the comments mm-hmm. because there was, oh, I there was said that on the there YouTube, on the, la- on the latest podcast episode, which was like 43 or something like that. Is that mm-hmm. what right. And the comments were, I, I, there was a bunch of people saying stuff like, I don't care what anybody says. I love your, your unorganized rambling style where, cause I, cause they were saying uh, they feel like they're really getting good advice and they don't care if it's like bullet pointed exactly and delivered in a mm. boring manner. You know, um, they like right. that. They like that. We're like having fun and they yeah. feel like we're like another common theme was they feel like we're they're there with us hanging out. Oh, cool. Well, what I like about, I don't know if anybody mentioned this, but what I like about this rambling format is that sometimes we'll end up in a place that's super interesting that we didn't know we were going to go. And if you're planning a bullet point, you may not even hit that point, but we exactly. do. End, we end up where we end up for a reason. There's, you know, some, some reason we're talking about. So you're saying you don't ever want me to, to make a list again for, for I calls. hate it when you make a list. Oh, and check it. I hate it. Crazy. I hate it when you check it twice. <laughs> <laughs> but how am I going to find out who's naughty or nice? <laughs> wow. All right. Well, that's the signal that we should probably get, get started. No, 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 no. Uh, seriously though, I do the list just, it's not to keep us on, on track or it's not to keep us from going off, but it's just, uh, it's a way so that my thoughts are more organized. So no, it makes it makes total sense. So some you're okay with need, that, Will, right? Some people need crutches, and that's okay. Oh boy, oh, you got me all flustered. Here we go, <laughs> right from the get go. Okay, what are we all talking right. about, Lee? Uh, Will doesn't want to have this conversation right now. It sounds like <laughs> <laughs> you guys. I should. I'm going to go ahead and do the disclaimer because I always say something. Jake is just sort of rude and doesn't pay. Doesn't say any disclaimer. But I'm going to be looking down because I'm painting during our podcast. Um, I got to finish get something out the door, and uh, it's due. So I'm going to be painting and talking. It's not that I don't love you guys. If you go to our YouTube channel, you'll see me looking down, and that, that sounds exciting. <laughs> go to our. So, YouTube channel. So far, what we've got from this podcast is you hate my list <laughs> and I'm rude. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is, a, this is a bag on bag on Jake. That's our topic, actually. <laughs> it's things we don't like about Jake. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> I can't wait. No. By, the, wait. by the way, our YouTube channel is Society of Visual Storytelling. Mm. Uh, the youtube.com slash society of visual storytelling. Right. If you if you if you Google or YouTube Society of Visual Storytelling, that that'll come up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's turn the okay. time over to Lee. It's his his topic today. What are we talking about today, Lee? All right. Here we go. This one's an important one. As you guys, for our trusty listeners who have heard other podcasts, I've been trying to weave in the life portion of picking an illustrator. You know, we don't go to we don't go to work nine to five typically. And when we say, hey, I'm going to be a pro illustrator, that means our, we're all in. Our whole life is involved. And so I wanted to, to talk about, you know, we got a big, a lot of feedback of people wanting to um, change careers. Like when we did that podcast, if you're thinking about you're working one job and you might want to be an illustrator. I wanted to go over the the hurdles, I guess, that we have with being an illustrator and being doing this for a living. And then also how we solved those particular 
particular issues. Um, I'm going to bring up a couple. I got a list here. Uh, no, wait, I don't have a list because we've decided that's. Important, <laughs> <but that's laughs> I'm going to be bringing up say. stuff off the cuff, just winging it, and um, you're not weak. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need a list, um, but you guys can feel free to either add your own or, or definitely chime in on on these topics. But these are just things to me that are the. There's a lot of upsides to being an illustrator, being creative all day and coming up with stories. And that's the, that's the, and drawing and painting. I mean, just doing that is such an enjoyable activity, but being a pro comes with a lot of other things. And I want to highlight that because sometimes when people are thinking about becoming an illustrator, they tend to idealize it quite a bit. I know this because whenever I meet anyone who's out in the normal world, a banker or my dentist or whoever, they ask what I do and I tell them and they're like, I mean, their eyes like light up. They're like, oh my God, that must be so much fun. And they're picturing us just sitting down and painting. But there's a whole side of this um, that requires work and, and, and you got to nuance it. So I'm going to give you guys, this This is in no particular order. But I'm going to start with just the way that, uh, that I thought of them and wrote them down. Here we go. Okay. So one of the problems that uh, I have, and I wanted to throw this out to you guys, is I, working from home to me is the number one drawback to being an illustrator. A lot of times when people, I mean, a lot of people are switching from being full-time employed to being self-employed, whether that's being an illustrator or whatever they're going to do. And uh, working from home is really tough. If you're at an office, you, it might sound really ideal. But to me, there's a couple things that come with working at home that make it really, really problematic. Number one is the isolation involved. That's why I love working with Will and Jake because, I mean, these, our meetings are, are fun. We need to talk about business stuff anyway, but I just love talking to them because sometimes I'm, especially if I'm doing a book and I'm in the trenches, I may not talk to, I may not talk to anybody the entire day. Mm. And for a social person, I mean, some people really, if you're, if you like being holed up by yourself, that can be a good thing. And sometimes I do like that, but as a whole, it, it really started weighing on me. And I started thinking to myself, you know, if you're in prison and you do something wrong, they put you in solitary confinement. And some days I feel like illustration is solitary confinement, even though I'm enjoying the actual thing I'm working on. Do you mm -hmm. guys have any thoughts? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Boy, let's hear it, Will. Well, in the, in the early days of my career, in the, in the late 90s, well, mid and late 90s, I was I would call, you know, out of the source books, out of showcase workbook, I would get a random number of an illustrator that I like their work and just call them up. Oh <laughs> my God. Talk to them. <laughs> so, so yeah. So I would, I, I called, um, Oh, what's his name? Um, I'm drawing a blank. I've, I've called so many illustrators and like, and they, and what's, what was sad is this is before internet, right? Yeah. Uh, well, not before internet, that is but sad. Be before <laughs> <laughs> before, not before internet, but before it was used mainstream right. like we do now. And right. so they would get the call and, you know, back in the day, that was the only way you got a job and freelance so job. They'd, was they'd answer line. right away. Right? Well, they'd answer all excited because <laughs> like, it was their business line. Hello, you know, blah, blah. somebody's calling. Yeah. And I'd go, um, so this is, and I could hear the, the excitement in their voice the whole time. And I'm like, I just love your work and was hoping to be able to talk to you. And it, it, the the emotion just went, oh, yeah, oh, yeah okay, let's talk go. shop. <laughs> sure, what do you want to know? And, and, and some of them were more standoffish, you know, and I'd always represent myself as a brand new illustrator trying to break in. And, mm -hmm. and some of them took pity on me and we had some really good conversation and conversations. And so anyway, but yeah, as far as the that's, isolation goes. That's that, bold. I mean, to be cold calling people just to talk. Yeah. I mean, that highlights what I'm talking about. Exactly. That's, I mean, that's a, that's a full on desperation move well, right it's there. It's like tapping on the cell wall, you know, <laughs> tapping out some Morse code. It's like anybody out there, you know? Yeah. It's, I, a, re it's a real issue, Jake. Yeah. I, uh, I actually love working at home and I love working in solitude. <laughs> and every time you're like, dude, let's talk. I'm just like, oh, can't wait for this to be over. <laughs> <laughs> Is Will calling me again just to chat? <laughs> <laughs> she was. No, I, uh, I actually am really more than happy to go eight hours in a workday without saying more than hello. Like, remember when we used to do that, Will? Hello in the morning, Will. And then, well, see ya. <laughs> 
at the end yep. of the day. <laughs> yeah. But now, now uh, let me ask you this. Is that, is that an every, like if I don't, if I've been social for the weekend or whatever, and I come back on Monday, I'm good for that. I mean, is it, was that just a momentary thing or like five days of the week? Are you in that mode? Like I would, I, I'd rather be left alone for, from nine to five, five days in a row. Is that how, what would you say? Well, how was I when, you, when we worked together in the same, same office? You mean when you were here in this one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, uh, one thing that I admire about you is that you, because you, and I, what's funny is I was telling Lily this the other day that you, because you're so focused on your family mm-hmm. and really trying to be a good dad and a good husband and you're focused on your work and you have a lot of work and a lot of different kinds of work, you'll, I would always see you making those little schedules in the morning for your time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you're like, if I needed to bug you, you would sometimes, if it didn't fit in your schedule at the moment, you'd be like, can you give me 15 or 20 more minutes, you know? And it was, you know, I'm, I'm just not that organized. Uh, I just, but I, I really appreciated that. I was like, you you know, you're focused. You know? Here, here's, here's what I'll say. I do value like shop talk and water cooler talk and stuff like that. But um, what I found when I work in a, a studio is I do so much of that, that I don't get work done. Yeah, And what I like about working at home is um, there's a good chunk of time in the day where my wife's off doing stuff, my kids are off doing things and I don't, I don't need, like, I don't need to, I can just get stuff done and I don't need to talk to, talk to anybody, anybody. I think it goes back to like in high school, like in high school is when I really started taking art seriously and I would, um, you know, do whatever you have to do all day as a high school student. But then I would come home and go into my room and just shut the door and I would just draw and, and make stuff until, you know, the, the late hours of the night. Sometimes, you know, staying up too late, uh, later than a high school kid should stay up. Right. And, um, and it was just great to be like in solitude, just me and my thoughts, like working together and making stuff. Um, but then the balance of that is then I, I do need like feedback and I do need to like bounce those things off of other people. So I would, I do come up for air and I, and I, and I, um, and I get that. But as far as like day-to-day work, I just, I don't like having anybody around me. (laughs) No, I, you know, it's funny that you say that because I don't like people talking to me. It's really weird. I like being around people, but then I don't want them to actually acknowledge me. You guys are freaks. <laughs> so like when I'm, when I'm in the studio or like the studio I'm a part of now. So part of this podcast is about identifying a problem and then identifying a solution. So how I solve that for my, myself, and I want to go over a couple of other problems that I have with being at home in the studio, but I'll go over in that second. Mm-hmm. Um, how I solved it for me is I just got a co-working space. And if you get enough people, think about like how you lived in college. Like that's how you basically treat your first studio is you pack as many people in there as you can. <laughs> And right. what I realized is that I don't need to be around people every day. Like, mm-hmm. like sort of like what Jake's saying, like as long as, as long as I know that there's a place I can go and there'll be people working, um, I don't have to be at the studio every day. So I still have, have a space at home and I'm using this, this studio space. There's 10, nine or 10 illustrators that are all in that space, but never, never or I have all 10 of them been there at the same time. And so there's, there's one girl there who works there only one day a week. But that satisfies that need for her, and the other four days she can be productive, knowing that she's mm. going to come in once a, once a week. For me, I think I'd like to be down there two to maybe three times a week. I definitely don't need to be down there every day. Um, and so we made it to where it's cheap enough, where we can just kind of acknowledge that it's there and then use it as needed. Um, mm-hmm. And man, that has that has really fit the bill for all ten of us. Really, we just use it as 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 needed. Um, okay. Let me tell an anecdote about Jake real quick. Oh boy. <laughs> that goes along with this. Jake's like, oh man. <laughs> no, remember Jake and you're not gonna name names, but remember that that guy that came in that scheduled time to come in uh-huh. to our office and he wouldn't leave and you had like a ton of stuff to get done. Oh. You know what I'm talking about. And he just freaking wouldn't leave. And mm-hmm. I saw your face. <laughs> And That's you were like, awesome. at first you were like, I can handle this. I can handle mm-hmm. this. 
And then I was like, I saw you get that look, like that taste in your mouth look. And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> and finally, when he left, you were so pissed off. I, you've <laughs> never seen me mad before. I've never to. seen you mad. What do, what you- <laughs> he was pissed because because it was pointless. And, the per, and this person was kind of thoughtless about like. They're just kind of rambling on. Sounds like our yeah, podcast. Well, the, the, per- the person did like, they're like, hey, could. And and I'm totally cool with like people who are respectable, you know, respect the time, um, listen and and want advice and and want. There's a back and forth, but this person came to just have us listen to them, mm. have me <laughs> listen to them. Uh-huh. Um, you know, and they set it up like, hey, I need to talk to you and about career stuff and decision stuff, but all they did was talk. And, I and it was a pro too, and it was yeah, I, so it was dumb. I didn't, I didn't get any. It's just a waste of time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that there's that. The one thing though, one drawback to working at home is um, I do feel like there's a window. There is that window of time, and and um, I, I guess there's two things. Like the family life can suck you away from work, and your work can suck you away from family life. And That's so you right. do have to be a lot more control, like uh, disciplined and controlling with your, with your time and your schedule. So what I've done is when it's the end of the day, you know, I set hours that I'm going to be in the office and when I'm good about it, I work through those hours and I ignore everything that's going on outside of the house or outside of the office door. And then when it's done, I used to have a commute, right? So what I'll do is I kind of have to do these uh, signals, the, whether they're auditory or visual or something that that symbolizes me being done. So it's shut down the computer, um, mm. you know, cl- clean up my desk, clean up my space, and really just like a finality to it, so that I know, oh, to go back in there means to turn on the computer again. To you know, if the computer's already on, if the workspace is already like there, and 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 I could just grab a pencil, I'll get sucked back in and uh, s- sucked back in. And, um, and then that's bad for like my family life too. So, so there's, there's the pro. So I guess working at a place, there's the con of everybody wants a piece of your time. Uh, and it's, and it's, you have to be disciplined to set up boundaries there. Um, but then it's also nice to have some of that professional interaction or that water cooled cooler talk. Cause I, I do miss like our morning chats. Will that, that was, that was it good. Was fun. Those are yeah. good times. Yeah. I think that, I think that sig- signaling is a is a or that little signal to your brain that something that you're at work or you're off work is really really smart. That was my next little talking point that that hits me with being at home is that it's just your day can come in, my kid comes in, my you know my wife's asking questions, and it just it blurs the whole work life kind of balance. Am I at work or am I at home? You're sort of both at the same time. And that means you're Mm -hmm. neither in my opinion. So Mm -hmm. my thing was I had to, I had to leave and then come back to really start my day. So in the morning I would always run or go to the gym and that would be my commute, I guess, Mm, sort of. Yeah. And it just signaled like, okay, when I come back, I take my shower, I put on real clothes. I don't just like I never worked mm-hmm. in my pajamas. I've signaled to myself with the run and, and the shower and, and getting dressed that I'm now going to work. And then when I would sit down, I was able to make that transition a little easier. That's good. Okay, what's what's the next one? Let me see. Da, da, da. Are you looking at the list? No. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> definitely not looking at a list. Um He's, he's just setting thinking. boundaries, setting boundaries and working too much. That was the, that was the other one. Um, the last little part that I'll add to the working at home thing that I found difficult is that there's, I don't know if Jake, if you were ever sort of let down, like at the end of the day, you're done, you put in a great day of work, you're done and you're like, okay, I'm off work. And then you're sort of still in the same spot. Mm-hmm. Like you're not in your studio, but you're just in the same space. Was there was it hard to kind of switch on to be excited about being home since you'd been there the whole day? I, I get excited when I'm at the studio and I come home because it's just different. Everything's different. You know, it's a new stimuli and all that. But did you have trouble? Like, yeah, there, there's maybe a little bit of that. And then, and, and uh, that's why I didn't mind meeting somebody for lunch. Just getting out. Some days. Or what I'll do is I'll schedule a day just, just to run like, errands like business related errands um 
where it's where I'll go to the paper store and I'll go to the art supply store and I'll go to, um, you know, there's this place here at Gilbert, um, like a creative studio place where a lot of different kinds of uh, creative pursuits are brought together under one roof and they all have like their little shops and stuff. So I'll go there and kind of meet people and talk to people there just to, just to have that feel like I've, I've left. Cause there, there will be weeks where the only time I leave the house is to like go to church on Sunday. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. other than or maybe drop a kid off at school. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> Will, you got anything else you want to add to that topic before we move on? There was one thing that I was thinking of, and I don't know how this applies as much, but I, I found that I was, uh, when I was in, living in California, I was un- unconnected to any other illustrators. I never visited with anybody. I was in a small town and I f- feel like I lost a lot of progression during those years. So whatever whatever happens like you i think as an artist you need to be connecting with other artists hanging out with them and that's one of the reasons why um we kind of came up with the draw lunch idea which i made a youtube video on that which is um basically a bunch of illustrators in our area out here get together and go and draw people at the mall in the food court and have lunch on fridays and even if you just do something like that you know maybe you can't afford to do what you're doing, Lee, where you have a studio outside of the home, you know, where I have this studio that's, that SVS is paying for. But, um, you know, that's, an, that's another alternative to solving that problem as a solution to that problem. I'm really glad you, you brought that up because that, that was kind of the hybrid that I was going to recommend to people. If you don't want a studio or you don't know enough people is to just go out and, and find a spot, even if it's a coffee shop, just getting out and maybe, establishing like, Oh, I do my sketches at the coffee shop. Then I come back and, you know, if you need your full setup or whatever to do a painting or becoming more modular, um, and, and have the ability to move different locations like Will and Jake both, but Will primarily but painting with the iPad pro has really made the world your studio. Right. So you yeah. can get mm-hmm. out. And- One thing too, that I would do, I, I used to do a lot was Skype sessions with uh, different artists. And so what we do is, it, um, we just turn on Skype and have it running for like four hours in a day. And it didn't matter if you're having a conversation or not. You could work in complete silence, nobody saying anything. And then all of a sudden it be like, oh, hey, did you see you know, the latest episode of... I can't God, that would make the TV show. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but uh, what was cool about that was then conversations would happen and it was feeling like you were in something, but I always found that, um, and I, and I got a lot out of that, like as far as professional development too, like just learning from other people and, and sort of feeding off of their, um, their energy and their, you know, what, what they're planning on doing for their projects and getting ideas for my projects and, and, Oh, this person finished the thing. Well, I'm going to go finish something too, because I know, um, I don't want to like show up and say, you know, didn't do something that I'd said I'd do stuff like that. Uh, but but there was this balance too, where it's like every time I did get in a big conversation, I wasn't working, and so right, right. ultimately it's like you have to like find that balance. Yeah, if you're not doing the work, then uh, you got to fix something because the work is you know foremost importance. You got to be finishing stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, ba ba All right, so that is the working from home problem. By the way, we're going to have a, uh, at, at svslearn.com, we have a forum and we're going to have this as a topic. I would love to hear people's feedback on this, whether it's in a, in a review on iTunes or whatever, or, or in the forum. I love it because people go back and forth, but I'd love to hear how you guys are solving some of these problems that we're talking about. I mean, there's probably a hundred other ways to work, uh, your, your work day. Um, and, and figure out this whole kind of balance. So we'd love to hear kind of what you guys are, are doing as well. All right. Again, I'm going through this list in my head, which I, I didn't write down in <laughs> random order. So it's not from most important to least important or, or even related in any way. The next thing that I just happened to write down that a lot of students um, or like even a lot of people when they're artists and illustrators, you make something for yourself and it is so much fun. Then you get hired to do something and you start this back and forth with your client. Now, sometimes that's easy and there's just a little something, something that you got to change. 
But a lot of times working with clients, if you haven't done it before, can be really difficult because you go back and forth so much or they have so much feedback for you that it's that the work starts to not feel like yours and it starts to not be fun as much. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, any thoughts there on how you guys have come to terms with that compromise that must be made and 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 is that something that just comes with the with the job and you should just suck it up or how do you deal with it yeah so what i do i i've had this before and at some point you realize in the process you realize oh this is one of those types of jobs (laughs) (laughs) and i have this mental thing where i just shift into mercenary mode where i'm just Mm -hmm. like okay i'm the hired gun I'm going to deliver a job, no question asked, no questions asked, and uh, collect my paycheck and move on as fast as possible. Even if that's a book or some kind of big thing with your name on it, I don't mind that for a little editorial job. But uh, well, with a yeah, I'm talking editorial jobs um, or or like maybe a concept art thing or or even you know concept art thing for whether it's like a, a video game or commercial or something where it won't be attached to my name but if it is a book um usually i try to i usually can kind of um gauge beforehand before saying yes what it's going to be and turn down things that i just that smell bad you know you can kind of <laughs> yeah. sniff them out and be like oh is know, there an is indicator good. that you look for in maybe the, the the proposal that you might say mm, i'm not feeling that like a little red flag basically I would like, typically, I think if it's any sort of project where it's a celebrity writer (laughs) type of thing, you're going to want to just know that they're going to have a lot of say, especially in the artwork. You know, if it's a project where it's like, this is about an actual person, like this is a story about my grandchild, you know, there's going to be, you know, some problems inherent there, or if it's, um, Mm -hmm. you know, because they're going to want it to look like their grandchild and they're going to want less, you know, you have less creative freedom and and there's, you know, or if it's, if it's, uh, um, you know, if it's something like, uh, 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 I just, my mind just went blank. Man, I was on such a good roll there. (laughs) Yeah, you were doing well. This is what happens when you're drawing and drawing and painting. (laughs) No, no. Uh, Anyway, uh, you know what I was going to say too. It's like um, if there if there's a certain subject matter too, where um, you you just know that maybe it doesn't have quite as much direction. Or the other thing too is like if if going with subject matter slash style if you know those don't perfectly align with what you already do and you're thinking like, why did they ask me to do this? Then, you know, there might, there might be problems there with, um, with how you deliver because you might not be able to deliver what they're asking for. Mm-hmm. I agree about the celebrity thing. You guys might think, Oh, that would be great to, to get a celebrity job, but it comes with a lot. Not that everybody's going to be offered. And that, a lot of times was- you don't even get to put your name on. They don't even put the illustrator's name on the book. Well, some weird things with that too. Yeah, you don't get your name, and then like sometimes the, they'll keep all the royalties. I mean, I've had all kinds yeah. of offers. Some, with, some, some of the Madonna children's books don't even give credit to the illustrators. It's like, buy Madonna. But, he, but here's I, the wait, thing. wait. Can I can I insert something just yeah. a just a little bit ch- tangential on that? And that is, um, uh, oh, hold on one second. All right, while he's doing that. <laughs> Jake just says, can I interject something? And then he walks off screen. And then he screen. walks off. That's classic Jake right there. <laughs> That's, so I'm going to tell you. Uh, Gee whiz. Okay, we'll, hold on. We'll edit that middle section out. Okay, oh, go. Oh, let's leave it in. we got to leave, leave in. all this in. No, it's got to be left in. Because people need to see that you're a mess. Uh, you know, people you're a hot mess Jake is there. a hot mess. Yeah. Okay, so here's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you to get too far off the topic because you I'll need forget. to. Do you need to go change the oil in your car first? <laughs> Jeez, come on. Come on, guys. All right, just, just be mean to Jake. <laughs> be mean to Jake Day. I could take it. I can I've got enough self-esteem. I can I can I can put up with that whatever you guys. All right, what is have. it? You're gonna forget. I know if You're you don't hurry and say it. Say it. I've been getting um I did a Christmas book last year. It came out last year. And it's by a, a fairly well known author. Um, she has a, a book that's like forever on the New York Times bestseller list. 
not this book though. <laughs> I wish, but, um, and she's great. She's been great to work with. And the publisher was great. And I loved the book was fun. It was everything, but on Instagram, people have been, um, these, there's Instagram accounts that talk about children's books and they highlight a children's book every day. And they keep highlighting this children's book and saying how much they love it and how beautiful the pictures are. And they only credit <laughs> her, the author. (laughs) And so what I've been doing is every time I, like I look at posts tagged with her in it so I could see when this comes up. Every time I see one of these come up, I'll repost it and say, thank you so much for this, you know, for highlighting the book. What a, you know, thanks for the shout out. And I'll, I'll say it was such a fun book for me to illustrate. And, and it's just my like subtle way of educating these um, Instagrammers that hey, yeah. there are two people that worked on this book, <laughs> not just yeah. not just yeah. the author. That is something that every illustrator is going to have to come to terms with. If you don't, if you didn't write the book, that no matter how great your illustrations are, the writer will get most of the credit for even some of the mm-hmm. things that you put in there that's not even in the writing and you play second fiddle if you read a review of a book a lot of times the illustrator gets one or two sentences maybe out of a whole paragraph or two paragraphs and they'll just talk about what medium he is that's typically like oh right. lee white works in watercolor and he has also illustrated this other book okay now back to the writer <laughs> like it's a yeah. picture but <laughs> can i tell my can i tell my favorite favorite story really quick i know sure. i've told it on here before but not everybody's listened to every episode. I was at a book signing. It was me and the author. We did a reading. She read the book. I did a like a drawing, live drawing for everybody in attendance there at this at this uh, at this bookstore. Um, afterwards, we set up the tables. Uh, we put the books out, and I sat down first. And there was a line already forming, and um, And this woman comes up with her book and I was like, okay, great. I'll sign it. Who do I make it out to? And she's like, oh no, I just wanted the author to sign it. (laughs) I was so, (laughs) I was so deflated. And right then I realized like, oh, it's, uh, we're living in an author's world. I'm just an an illustrator living in an author's (laughs) world. And my analogy is that we're like the the taxi cab drivers for the authors. Mm -hmm. We get them, we get them from point A to point B. Get them where they want to go reap all the the credit and everything. Um, I was going to say to this subject that you've basically outlined, you've you've outlined the classic problem of an illustrator from the days of Michelangelo. You know, I mean, like being told, you know, it's it's this constant battle of, you know, if you're being told what to do, is it art? If you're being told what to do, is there room for you as the artist to be an artist Mm -hmm. within the parameters of the job? And I, and I think that uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no, you know, kind of what you've, what you guys have already kind of talked about. But I, th- I think as you progress as, as, a, um, as an artist, as an illustrator, the, the further your career moves, the, the, the more you're able to see those troubled jobs and turn them down. So I have experienced having less of what you described, the, the, the job where you're like, ugh. You know, the, right. I, hate, I hate working on this. That's happened less and less to where, like I, I mentioned one, I'm not going to talk about it, but this this job that came from Sweden um, months back, you know, back in the summer, where as soon as it started going south, I fired them. Because I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I, see, I know exactly I remember. Where, where this is going and you're I done. I do remember, yeah. And then they got all mad and I'm like, no, I'm happy. <laughs> They're like trying to, well, you're not going to get to do the job. And I'm like, you don't understand. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm telling you. I don't want to do the job. <laughs> yeah, um, and 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 that's something to look forward to as as a if you're if you're getting a lot of jobs that are really or a lot of clients that are really driving you crazy, just know that those are stepping stone jobs to a better life as an illustrator. And a lot of illustrators end up becoming gallery artists for that very reason: is that they finally get to a point where they feel. That would be me. That, yeah, they 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 <laughs> you know you get to a point where you're like. <laughs> I figured out how, what, to, what I want to say, how I want to say it. And I don't need an art director to do it. And I can generate my own audience or a combination of the two. A lot of illustrators um, continue to illustrate, but they also do gallery work. And in, and in a sense, lessening the, the opportunities for those bad jobs. So, 
Yeah, that's my remedy. I mean, like I said, this podcast really is about coming up with solutions to this this problem. And I would just recommend, I do recommend everybody go through those jobs because you grow so much as an illustrator, you grow so much as an artist, but keeping your personal vision going on the side will remedy this situation. Because as long as you know you have that painting you're working on, it's all yours, it's at home, and you're going to work on it at night or, or on weekends or whatever, it really does soften the blow. Um, but going back to what Will just said, a lot of people do end up leaving illustration for this exact reason. They go to, to gallery. I think this is st- some people may say, well, why don't I just sidestep it and just go straight to gallery? You need to know if you're going to do that, you still have to sell work. There's still a commerce there. And the benefit of like, I'm slowly m- moving a little bit more gallery oriented. The, the benefit is I've done illustration for so long and then slowly edged my way into gallery that I know what to expect as an income, what sells, what doesn't sell, and you can make the uh, a smart decision because you still have a buyer that you have to deal with. Now, it, when you're with a client, working with a client, the client is essentially the buyer at that point, but they're dictating the work. Same mm-hmm. is true for a gallery, except for they're not going to dictate what the work looks like. They just won't buy it. Mm-hmm. So it's worth it to go through all, through this stuff. And even to, even if you're just going to stay in straight illustration to know how to deal with a client and get what you need to get out of it. Um, and then at some point you're going to have a difficult enough client where you got to do what Jake said, where he says, let's pull the plug. Hey, I'm just illustrator. You, you want me to make that red? I'll make it red and just let go of your ego and control of it and just do it and get, and get on with it. But it's a tough thing to acknowledge when you're coming from school and every single, that's my problem with schools most of the time is that the, the assignments are so wide open. I mean, you could, you could sew, there was a girl in my class who sewed her final <laughs> and it was just so obscure and peculiar and it was cool, but like, could, was it, would that be reproducible in a job type situation? I mean, it's right. just, it's just so open-ended. They treat, they treat illustration school like fine art school. You do whatever mm-hmm. you want to. And then you get out and you realize, no, it's not like that at all. It'd be better if you were interacting with your teacher like an art director so you can cuss at him and say, oh, mm-hmm. he wants me to do it like this, but I don't want to, but I have to anyway. Because um, you get used to figuring out how to do that. Anything else to add to that? No, that's good. Wrap that one up in a bow for Christmas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, this one's, this one's a tricky one. Um, and I'll just let you guys grab it. The infrequent paychecks uh, is a tough thing to balance out. How do you guys go about making any kind of life plans? It's one thing to be just a single person and getting an infrequent paycheck, but we all have families and you know people that are going to be mid-career may have other responsibilities, a mortgage car and all this stuff. How do you negotiate in the infrequency of how we're paid as illustrators. It's, it's, you know, as soon as you launched this subject, I was like, that's the first thing I thought of. Cause that's, mm-hmm. a, that's the hardest thing I think for people to figure out how to do. And what's funny is everyone knows the answer. It's just hard to live that answer. What's I mean, answer? you know, you know what the answer is. This is well, rationing. Yeah. You have to, um, beans have to and spend, rice. spend a lot <laughs> less. <laughs> And so, so, you know, um, you know, we're right now, you know, I have a, a pretty decent job and it's going to pay sometime in, it'll probably pay sometime in April or May, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I can see that money and I'm going to have that money. And guess what? We can't make decisions with that money until we get that money. And right. the, the thing is the job could get canceled. That happens. Mm-hmm. There's a 2% chance of that happening. Um, Two, is that an actual Yeah, I did the math. That you know? I've done all the research. And it's, it's, you know, um, <laughs> sure. Two you percent cancellation so, rate. You just said it so authoritatively that I was yeah. like, it's a two well, we really know. In some countries, it's 2.8. European countries, it's 3.1. But uh, The Netherlands actually has a 4.0 percentage rate there. Yeah. So. But, but, but... <laughs> I don't know why that tickled my funny bone so hard. <laughs> oh, right when I was taking a drink of water too. <laughs> okay. But, but yeah, you got to, you really have to um, get comfortable with the fact that you just can't spend it until you have it. And even when you have it, you need to keep a reserve. So the way that I try to live is off of a six to nine month reserve, you know, of assets and money. And some of it's invested. Some of it's not, um, you know, liquid at the moment, but it could be liquidated really yeah. easily. 
Yeah. And I could live for pretty much a year without having, without getting paid. It would, it wouldn't be fun. Right. right. The, year, I, the year is my recommended time frame for people when I'm giving business advice, whether that's going to be for a, being an illustrator or anything. If you're self-employed, um, a year is kind of standard for if you don't have enough to live for a year, you don't have enough to be the full-time yeah. job doing that thing. And one of the, I, I got to tell this, Jake, I have to tell this story. I have, okay. to, Let's I have hear to fit it. it in there. And it's, this is what got me to that, to the year. And I, and I had to, I had to have financial meltdowns more than once, but the one that I really remember was I had a, a coin jar and I had a penny jar, this huge penny jar filled with pennies and a huge coin jar. Filled. And we were month to month, maybe every, maybe had enough to live for a month or two and waiting to collect on a couple of really big assignments. And the money just wasn't coming in, wasn't coming in, wasn't coming in. Bills are stacking up. Bills are getting paid late. Panic starts setting in. What's going to happen? I'm calling these, calling my clients, like, where's the check? Oh, you know, the accountant went on vacation, blah, blah, blah. They're going to be back next week. I'm like, oh, it's not even in the mail yet, you know? <laughs> and I'm dying. And finally, I'm like, I have to get that coin jar out. So I got the coins, took it to Coinstar, the, to the bank, you know, their equivalent of Coinstar. And I got about a hundred bucks. And so we went and bought groceries. We got some gas in the car, blah, blah, blah. Waiting for the checks, still not coming. And I'm looking at that penny jar. And I had oh to cash God. in the pennies. And I got <laughs> 20 bucks of pennies. And I went to the grocery store. And instead of buying the, the bread we normally buy, I bought the, the, the store brand 50 cent loaf of bread, you know. That's, uh, that's you didn't crappy. even get the Roman meal? No. And I got, I got a, a gallon of milk and got a big sack of potatoes. And just stuff that, I mean, I was like, it was dire, you know, and man, did I learn a lot from that, you know, and then, the, and then the checks came in the next week and you, and you're, you got all this money and it's like, that was dumb. What we did there was really dumb. We need to fix that. And, it, you know, some people can do it, could, could actually fix that problem without having to live it. Right. They can, they're smart and they can live, learn from other people's mistakes. I wasn't, I had to learn from it. Yeah, one of the things that people learn real quickly too in this in this profession is that everything that comes in is not your income. That no. you still got taxes and stuff to pay. And so I've seen people when they're um, you know they're struggling artists and they might get a big book deal, say they get seventy five grand or a hundred grand all at once, and then they buy a boat or something, not realizing that there's a huge chunk of that. At least thirty percent is what I would recommend allotting of your income mm-hmm. that's going to go to to bills and also running your studio and your business. Yeah. Uh, but they don't think that they're like, hey, I got a hundred grand. You don't have a hundred yeah. grand, but they spend a hundred grand and then they end up, uh, you know, it's really the, struggling. It's the Dave Ramsey thing: live like no one else, so you can live like no one else. You know, trademark yeah. Dave Ramsey. We don't know. All that. right, Jake, I got to do it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I was I was just gonna throw in there that I don't I don't do a full year, but I do three to six months, depending on it fluctuates depending on surprises that pop up and whatnot. Um, but, but the thing that, that I've done to, to deal with this is I look at, I pretty much look at any sort of illustration job that comes in as a bonus. And I try to live off of things, uh, things that I've set up that are, um, that are, uh, revenue streams that are coming in that I don't have to like, that don't really fluctuate that are sort of stable. And what's it, what's the word for that? It's, um, passive, passive income, right? <laughs> <laughs> is that, that's what, that's what it is, right? Yeah. So, uh, why are you well, laughing? Sort of, sort of, sort of. Passive okay. income is different than, than predictable income, but, but I see where you're going with it. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's the difference there? Passive income is more like investments. <laughs> Well, passive income is work that you don't have to actually work to get it. In my, in in our case, it would be prints. Like that's mm-hmm. just I don't have to do any additional work. My hours are I still have all my available hours to work other things. It's just kind of money you got. Or royalty checks is a passive income stream. But predictable income is like, hey, I work as a teacher and I do have to put some hours in and I get paid for that. But at least the paychecks are every two weeks. Yeah, I'm talking passive income then. So like my online shop. Um, pays a certain amount of my bills every month reliably. Um, I just have to, 
you know, make sure there's enough product stocked. I have to make sure I'm just posting about it here and there, making sure yeah. people know about it. And um, I do things like uh, affiliate marketing where, uh, you know, Amazon links and things like that. And that's, that's like all these things are just a couple hundred dollars here, a thousand dollars there, another couple hundred dollars there. But it's, it's enough to have me have at least like a base uh, set of income, like a, like a, a mortgage insurance base and anything right. on top of that, i just make sure I budget enough with my other illustration jobs that, yeah. um, that it works. That's well, definitely, let me not, add, definitely not passive income though. Yeah. Let me add to what Jake's saying. Cause what he's saying is, is, is important. That last little point that he made base income is the remedy against this and that whether that's a passive income stream like it, i mean if you're mid-level or or been doing this for a long time like us three you may have these passive income streams but i could see a lot of people eye rolling when we say just just sell a bunch of prints and that'll pay for your house <laughs> <laughs> we run the risk of becoming disconnected because we're at a different place than a lot of our listeners and so um i just well, realized that after we the last two topics we said uh, free, to, 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 to balance out the pay scale, we just have a bunch of passive income. And then the last one is how do we deal with a, uh, uh, a client when we get celebrity book offers? We're, <laughs> we we, so, we got to tone it back a little bit. Um, well, I think I, establish the other the one, the other topic I, I really want to get in here before, before we get off topic is, is which, uh, country club yeah, to join <laughs> as a working illustrator. No, no, no. That's, that's actually not problem. it. Where do you guys board your horses? <laughs> <laughs> the, funny no. thing is, the, the, the hard thing though is that, is that when you're starting out, you do not see, I never saw anything except me kind of struggling to, to continue to try to get um, freelance work. Well, the, the, mm -hmm. so going back to my point, establish a base of some sort, whether that is, part-time pizza delivery, by the way, my favorite job I've ever had, um, or part-time at a, I mean, just doing something part-time. A lot of people in illustration, even up in, including the senior level, teach. And mm -hmm. it's easy to get a job at community, or community colleges or local colleges teaching adjunct, one or two classes, even if it's in the basic art department, doesn't even have to be illustration per se. A lot of people teach kids on the weekends at different community <laughs> programs, just some kind of thing where you are making a steady amount of income. And then the illustration income, like Jake said, just is money on top of that. And then once you can start to build up that uh, nest egg and a little bit of, of you know, build out like a, maybe you get six months, eight months, a year of income that's sitting in your bank account. Um, then you can justify maybe quitting that part-time thing. But a lot of people keep the steady thing their whole life just because it is steady and it is so unsettling to have infrequent paychecks coming in at random, random times. Well, and I want to back up my statement here. Um, I have put out a self-published project every year for 20 years, basically. And the first one was done at Kinko's and it cost me 50 cents or a dollar per object to make. And I sold them for $5 and I sold a hundred of them. But what it did was you, it, there's sort of a compounding effect on that. It's that year after year, you get a fan who bought the first one, who buys the second one, who tells a friend who buys the third one, and then they've bought the third one. And so at first it was just a hundred copies I was selling and now it's thousands of copies that I'm selling of self self published projects. Right. And so, uh, you know, you, you think about, it, it comes down to this and there's a decision that you have to make in your career about, are you going to focus on what's urgent or on what's important? And the urgent stuff is stuff that's going to pay you right then or stuff that needs to, you know, fires that need to be put out right then, emails that need to get back, you know, people need to be gotten back to right then. But the important stuff is the stuff that's going to pay you the next decade or the stuff that's going to set you up to have success in 10 years or in five years. And so I think I've consciously made decisions about setting aside time, setting aside creative energy to work on important things and to push back on some of these urgent things and let those let a few of those things slide because I knew I needed some, you know, I know I need some sort of thing to that I own that is mine that I have control over. And 
and that can be a, a, like a supplementary income. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm dealing right now with a, a furnace that needs to be replaced in my house and I'm juggling money and trying to delay paying for things that we need. We've got a, a list of things that like wants, wishes, and needs, and trying to balance those things out. And at the same time, I'm paying for this licensing show in Vegas for June. Right. Or May. Is it May? And you're rolling the dice there. You don't know if anything's going to come I don't know if I'll make any money off of that. And so... (laughs) But that's a choice between something urgent and something important. Right. And the point being is that if you're like you going back to you, what you said, Lee, if you, when you, when you get a $5,000 job or a $10,000 job and you, you're like, I'm going to have 5,000 or 10,000, but you need to get in the habit of saying, no, I have two or 3000 out of that that I can use. And, and I'm going to try to save the rest so that, because it's a scary thing for me to think about being a freelancer and just relying on, enough freelance coming in. There's times where, where it does, you know, and like Lee right now, you're in a situation where you keep getting these book offers and you could just be doing book after book, after book, after book. And you have, you have higher goals and you have higher desires, you know, for your life and for your, you know, for your business choices. But for, you know, the, the power as an artist, I feel, is in being able to have more choices. So you've already, the thing is, we've already setting up our lives to not punch a nine to five clock. That's, we're already winning because we're not doing that. So we already have all these options of things we can do with our time. And it's not just doing freelance assignments. There's all sorts of things we can do. And a lot of those other choices, those business opportunities take money. Mm-hmm. So... Try getting in a mindset of just because I'm making X amount of money doesn't mean I spend it now. There'll be a time because I'm trying to build wealth over time so that my, my, my older years, my, my elderly years, I hate saying that word. Elderly. <laughs> I don't ever want to be elderly. Well, you got to keep but, your radar up though, right? About all these potential yeah. opportunities and, and there's risk reward. Like last week when I was trying to buy that foreclosure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, talk about risk, but, um, you got to have money to do this, some of this stuff. And so you yeah. got to, it's going to be an evolution of your career, but like Jake and Will are saying, you know, you got to dedicate little bits to it and you got to look around. I don't, I just don't, the unfortunate thing about our job is that we can't just come into the studio and paint and draw all day. And that, that bums me out, but that's mm-hmm. the reality of it. Maybe mm-hmm. some people get to do that if you have a rich spouse or uh, you're an heir to a company or something, but most people just don't get to do that. So every time I, when I do get to sit down and paint and draw, I really just relish that and I appreciate it because there's so much other crap you have to do all day to, to make a living at this stuff. I know I was telling a friend of mine that lately I feel like, well, lately not feel like it, but I, my job is actually way more administrative than it is creative. And, <clears> um, and I, and then I, again, I, I, concede that that's like a phase that I'm going through right now. It's a, maybe a necessary thing right now so that I have more time to be creative and less time to have to be administrative in the future. Mm-hmm. But for now, there's just a bunch of things I'm trying to set up and get going and work with and help. And they require emails and you know writing uh, proposals and all that kind of stuff so that I can be more creative in the future. For sure. That's a tough topic. That's an interesting one. And everybody's got to address it on their own terms, I guess. Um, But sometimes it helps to know that everybody's going through it. So Mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad to talk about it. Um, The next one kind of piggybacks on top of that one. Um, And this one can be short, but I just, there's definite points that I want to hit here because I've seen some Facebook stuff going around that is so inaccurate. It's crazy. And that is about health insurance for freelancers. Mm -hmm. Um, The one thing I'll, I'll ask you guys how you, negotiate that. But the one thing that I want to add right off the the bat, especially for new illustrators and people that are just going freelance and all that stuff is healthcare is crazy expensive. The the, um, marketplace for healthcare is it's terrible. The, the plans you're going to pay depending on your situation between 900 and 1500 a month is what they have. If you just go to um, 
healthcare.gov or whatever that is. Mm-hmm. It's, it looks astronomical. But if you make under 81000 there's a line in the sand, and that's what I wanted to talk about, that line in the sand. If you make under 81000 cumulatively if you're married um, or singularly, if you're, I think it's 45 or 50 if you're single, you get a subsidy. And the subsidy will typically almost pay for those lower level plans like the bronze level health insurance plans. And, and so knowing that 81,000 is really important because say you're, ma- I just use that 81,000 because if you're a married couple, I'm married. So that's the number that hits me. And so that's one I always pay attention to. But if you go over 81, it is easy to bring as a freelancer, it's easy to bring your income back to 81,000, depending on how you invest your money. And that's where keeping your expenses low and having the freedom to have a little bit of dollars extra to invest that comes off your taxes that keeps you under 81. As long as you're under 81,000, you can talk to your CPA about the complications of that and the, the details of that. But as long as you're under 81, you get the subsidy and, and your health insurance will almost be free as a freelancer. Great. So if you go over, if you're way over that much, just get, don't go on to um, healthcare.gov, go to a private plan. There's a bunch of them. Um, United Healthcare is one of them that we used last year and mm-hmm. it was quite good. And your, your rates are going to be for a family of three, it's going to be about 400 bucks. It's way less than the government plan. Um, it's not as good. I mean, in terms of if you get in trouble, you're going to pay a little bit more out of pocket, but it's pretty good. And the, the, the monthly rate is, is cheap. How do you guys deal with health insurance? Well, first off, I might disclaimer that this is not financial information, financial advice from us. Oh, this has <laughs> because that's important to 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 make sure so that we nobody yeah, yeah we're not don't liable come for back anything. to me yeah but but yeah I mean like that's exactly where we are and there's creative ways of uh, you know uh, like like one thing we you can pay your kids um, we were talking about that the other day. Um, so that you can deduct the income, the, the money that you're paying them to do chores around your studio. There's I want all to reiterate, sorts of ways. we are not experts or recommending any of not this. Not tax okay, advisors. Go ahead. <laughs> but, but there are, and you can look those up and, and they're easy to find online strategies. Um, you could put money like like in your HSA. Um, Offshore accounts. <laughs> I pay my cat. My cat is my studio manager. <laughs> you know, one of the advantages of putting money in that HSA is that you're, those are, those, those are, you can double dip on the taxes. So you it's don't hard. pay money. You don't pay taxes on the money going in or coming out. HSA, for those of you guys who don't know, is a health savings account where you put money in throughout the year. And then if something happens, then you can use that money yeah. for your medical care. But it's a, it's a, it's a beast figuring out this portion of a freelance life. It's so, it's not sexy to talk about at all. Um, Jake, yeah. how do you get through it? Uh, I just pay a ton of money for insurance. I have five kids and every one of them has their own health problems and we've got braces and all kinds of stuff. So my solution is to go make a ton of extra money just to pay for, <laughs> <laughs> just to pay for insurance. <laughs> Oh, that's good advice from Jake. <laughs> I would think with Speaking five that, kids, I have, you a, get... I have a new print in the shop. <laughs> it's called uh, braces. How to pay for a, a, a cat scan <laughs> out of pocket. Thank you. Please go buy it. <laughs> Our healthcare for for freelance people and and business owners, small business owners, is is a disaster. I mean, it really can wreck you if something happens to you. Uh, I've, I've had back problems this year and um, it's, it's taken its toll trying to, trying to navigate through that health insurance stuff. So it pays to try to understand it and, and to talk about it with your other free, if you've got a little group of artists, you know, really talk, this is the stuff that people don't talk about that much because it's so lame to talk about, man, there's just little nuances. And like, if you make 83,000 a year, now you don't get the subsidy. And now, and that subsidy can be $13,000 a year. So it's kind of gross, but yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a lot I mean, of people listen to our podcast that aren't even that that don't live in this country. So we probably don't want to spend too much time. Yeah, yeah I didn't want. I just so wanted to different. hit that one little little thing. If, if you don't, if you live in a different country, you probably are covered depending on where you are. Most most other um, first world countries have a, some kind of provided uh, insurance, and you don't have to deal with this as an individual, which is it's rough on people. Yeah. yeah. 
Anyway, I, every time we've like done the math, like, hey, maybe I should go get a job that has insurance or she should get a job that has insurance. It always comes back to like my earning potential doing like a side gig in the year ends up being better than whatever time and creative and energy investment in doing, you know, whatever I could do to get insurance provided by a, a, a job or, or something like that. So it's all good. We've got it worked out. We're figuring it out. And at the end of the day, you know, my, my goal is to die without any money in, in my pockets. <laughs> it's all gone towards children or uh, institutions or donated or whatever. So there we go. Your goal should be that the, that the uh, funeral home check bounces. Yep. That's there we why go. you know you've lived a full life. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next um, that's, that's sort of all of my topics, um, that I, that I have listed out in my head, not written yeah. down. Um, do you guys have any other thing that you deal with as an, as an illustrator? That's kind of a hurdle that needed to be overcome. I think you hit the main ones for me. What about um, life balance? I, I think that is, that's the other sort of big one that, that we really didn't get into is how do you, how do you balance, um, Family life, I talked about a little bit working at home, but family life, friend life, health, um, you know, taking care of your, your body, uh, taking time to exercise, all those, you know, taking time to like just entertain yourself, things like that. And I think there it's just, uh, again, it goes back to um, um, disciplining yourself so that you do have set boundaries of I'm going to work on this during this amount of time, I'm going to save enough money so that I can do a vacation. I'm going to work, uh, schedule projects so that I have time to take a vacation. Like right now I'm planning on, I'm, I'm going to do a ton of work this week, work late so that the next two weeks I could take completely off. We're recording this right before Christmas, by the way. I know you guys are hearing this in the new year, but, uh, so I could just take two weeks off and not have to worry about going into my, my studio at all. So I can just focus on whatever's happening day to day. And that's what I try to do. I try to do that in the summertime too. So I can do two, three, you know, I've done as many as five weeks off with a little bit of work happening in between taking my laptop with me to do things, but, but really being out of my studio for five weeks and doing ton of work beforehand, um, saving up enough money to be able to not stress about money during that five week break. And, and uh, I think it's just being wise and having, having a plan about what you're doing. Cause that's the thing too. It's like, you don't have to like, you don't have to work a normal 40 hour work week. And if you're smart about it, you could maybe, I mean, you could maybe do a 20 hour work week and make the same amount of money as you would during 40 hours a week doing this mm -hmm. job. You know, it's true. Like, that That's kind of going to be my point is that, that just to give you guys a hard kind of example of being, fairly rigid in setting up your schedule. So the stuff gets done in a conscious way. And so for me, that means I've got two different avenues that I'm working on right now. I've got a gallery show that I'm going to do and I've got a book that's due. And so for me, my day looks like four hours of book and that is four 50 minute periods. And then four of those same 50 minute periods for the gallery stuff. And as long as I know that those exist, I can get all the work I need to get done. And I'm, I'm, my time is allotted for, and then there's one day a week where instead of doing, um, one of those, I have some admin time and it works really, really well as and, and knowing that those times are set and keeping those boundaries. I mean, it's going to look different for everybody, but it really does have to be, in my opinion, that conscious of your, mm -hmm. of your day. It can't just be like, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to do an illustration today without, time marking or any kind of thing like that because the day will get away from you immediately and then yep. your family time will get away from you and the worst part of that of not figuring that out is when you're with your family you always feel guilty for not working and then when you're working you feel guilty for not being with your family and that is a, the worst feeling mm -hmm. right yeah yeah there's that there's um one thing that i also that when i first started working independently on my own I would finish a day or I'd finish a week and I'd be like, I've been in here for, for eight, 10 hours a day this week. And I cannot pinpoint what I've actually gotten done. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I can't point to five illustrations. I can't point to, you know, an empty inbox. And so what I started doing was, um, 
two things. I would make a, a daily to-do list and I could look down and see all the check marks. And then I knew, okay, I, those are all the things I did today. I could feel good about. I actually accomplished stuff today because I know I was getting stuff done. I just, there was no accountability, right? And then the other thing was uh, writing down how much time I spent doing everything so that, I, and then being honest, you know, if there was uh, 30 minutes spent on social media or YouTube, I'd write that down and that's what I did that, that 30 minutes. Right. Uh, but just so that I could be accountable and know, okay, uh, things are getting done. There's, there's times of the day where I'm more, uh, productive. There's times of the day where I'm less productive. Let's plan accordingly. And, um, and that was just, a, a I'm way more organized and way more conscious about my time and how long things take now than I've ever been, uh, working at a studio or working a day job. Um, mm-hmm. because I'm, I, again, it's like, it all comes down to me. Right. I, I, th- I think you guys are kind of talking about how you're combating procrastination in a way. Right. Mm-hmm. And yep. cause that's a big problem that you, we didn't really identify in that word, but I mean, like if you, if you're used to punching a clock and having a boss and having a manager telling you having tasks you have to do, and then you, you're at home. One of the questions I've gotten asked over the years is how do you avoid procrastinating, you know, and I've had people say, I just, I don't, I don't think I could work at home because of that. And my, my biggest thing is the work for work first, play later Mm -hmm. mentality. And I do that on a macro and a micro scale. So work first, play later is prioritize the things that have to be done. And then within those things that have to be done, and I'm talking about things around the house that need to be done, things in this, in the, in the, in your illustration life that have to be done things to support your illustration life, just all the different tasks that you have to do. Drawing is the funnest one that you get to do. Mm -hmm. And especially like, uh, you know, like I'm working on my own, um, book that I'm going to be announcing at some point. And one thing that I really want to do that I haven't had time for is making some images, making a few extra images for that book that are going to be purely fun. And the reason that I haven't done them yet is because I've had pressing things, a lot uh, more things that I've prioritized higher on the list because they're harder, because they're less appealing. And so I, the whole work first, play later hits with my work too. I don't, I don't look at the fun part of my work and do that, all that and leave the hard stuff. I always attack. If I've got, if I've got uh, a company that owes me money and I have to make a collection call or a service that I want to turn off. And it's really hard to get a hold of the company. I put those, I prioritize those higher and get those, mm-hmm. try to knock those things out. Cause those are the things that are going to constantly eat away at your mind and, and yeah. drag you yeah. down. I have to be better about that. Cause I, I will put stuff off until the last minute, as you know, Will, <laughs> stuff that I don't <laughs> want to do. <laughs> not that I don't like, not the thing I did for you. I didn't want to do it, but it was just like, I knew it didn't fit things that don't fit in with everything else and you just think, okay, you know, and I was talking with my son about this too and my wife and it's like, she's the type of person, like if it's something I don't want to do, it gets done first. So it's Mm -hmm. done out of the way. And that's how I treat like dinner. Like I'll eat vegetables first so I can be like, (laughs) don't have to worry about those. They're not the last (laughs) thing. I should do it more so in my, in my uh, day-to-day life with, with my work. Well, one thing that happened, I do want to make the distinction that I, I agree that procrastination is a problem, but also just job drift is, I don't know, a better term to, to think of it. I can be in the studio, like you were saying, Jake, and actually be working, but not on the right thing. And I'll spend uh-huh. like two hours doing that. And I'm not procrastinating. I'm just focused on something that makes is not the best thing to be focused on. Yeah, I call that productive procrastination because you're procrastinating the thing you're supposed to be working on, but you're doing something that still is moving the needle on some project. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like I'm watching TV or I'm just sitting there going, God, I really don't want to start the project. I'm actively busy. And yeah. like say, say something was going to take 10 minutes, but now it's all of a sudden taking two hours and I'm still just messing with it. Um, that's why I got to have the 50 minute blocks because that gives me a time to look up, come back for air and say, mm-hmm. Whoa, why am I, I'm, you know, I'm diverted. I'm over here and I need to be, to put that away now and do something else. And so I love the 50 minute blocks because it puts a stopping point on the drift. And for me, I'll drift all day long on some yeah. stupid thing. <laughs> well, I recently, I just 
dealt with this because uh, I every year around December, you know, towards the end of the year, uh, January, December, that time, I get this idea that I need to um, change my logo, <laughs> my JP logo, <laughs> right? Did we talk about this last podcast a little bit? I don't know if it was a podcast or just our, our meeting that we were having, but it was just me telling you that I thought it was dumb. I oh yeah, that's, that's right. Was. Yep, yep. <laughs> dumb that my logo, my logo is dumb, or dumb that I want to change it. You choose. Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah. You walked, you walked in. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Anyways, the reason being is my my logo in my JP. It's on all my social media. It's on my website. It's on all of my books. It's on my business card, and um. And it's a great logo. It does the job, but it's never felt like sexy. It's never felt like uh, it's not, it doesn't have swagger. It doesn't turn heads. Right. And so when I tell people I want to change my logo, they're like, uh, why, why do you even care? Why do you need my, like my son even, and he's, he's old enough to care. He's 18. And he's like, just get a crayon out, <laughs> write a J and a P, <laughs> scan it in, and you're done. Um, but I actually spent like a couple hours redesigning a logo. I didn't get anywhere. It didn't like anything. I realized I need an actual professional for this. But but that is that was productive procrastination because I know like if you have a cool logo, you could slap that thing on a sticker, and now people want to like show off the sticker. You could put it on a T-shirt, and it doesn't look dumb on a T-shirt. You can you, you could put it on a book and it just looks good on a book. So I want to have something nice. And that's why I always come back to this. I just want a nicer logo. But is it something pressing and important that needs to be done right now? No. And so um, sometimes, I, and I, I go back to my thing, like, is it urgent or is it important? <laughs> and uh, sometimes I put off urgent things like getting these checks deposited and paying my lawyer <laughs> for... Uh, something important where I think if I put some time and some invest some money into some cool Jake Parker branding, uh, it could pay off in, in dividends, you know, down the line. I gotta be honest. I spent eight hours researching for picture frames yesterday. <laughs> they, <Wow>. Yep. <laughs> It's Life's important. I mean, it's, it's exactly what Jake's saying. It's important because if you're doing a gallery show and you make the wrong choice, mm-hmm. you are in for a lot of money and a lot of pain if it's not right of replacing them. And so you want to get it right. It's, the problem compounds on itself and is exponential. As you do more work, you got this big body of frames. It's not just one frame, by the way. I'm not just agonizing over one wall frame. But if right. I'm looking at a gallery show of at least 24 to 36 images, so 24 to 36 frames, you do the math. Um, but I spent way too, I should have just made a decision. Nobody, I was asking Lisa to come in. She was looking at frame differences that had a one eighth inch difference in spacing and she's like i don't even know what you're talking about you guys well, yeah. you guys should go out to dinner with lee and watch him peruse the menu <laughs> <laughs> it's never ending <laughs> not true I, I have no sophistication there i just order simply but man you get a frame in front of me and we can talk about it for four hours i i know what you're thinking i know what you're talking about too it's like uh those little things they they get at you and 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 i do feel dumb afterwards sometimes with some of these where it's like Gee whiz, just like uh, last, last uh, yesterday, I spent way too long just designing one image for a, an announcement on Instagram, right? All I had to say was, thank you, and put a logo on there, and I hemmed and hawed and went back and <laughs> forth, and should it should be like this, and what's the font? No, the font's not good, and, uh, and you just feel dumb afterwards because you're like, that could have... But the, but the other way, the other thing is like, I feel like, the, um, like you have to go through that every once in a while, just so you know, like, just so you know that you've exhausted all the options. Right. And sometimes it's a either pay now or pay later situation. That's how I view the frames. Yeah. If I do feel dumb for spending eight hours, but if you make the mistake, the pay is so big. And then you still got to make the other the decision again if it's yeah. wrong. So I don't know. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to delegate your, what's important sometimes in, in this lifestyle. Mm-hmm. In this job. Well, that's a good, that's a good way to end it. Probably. 
It's important that we end it. <laughs> not, That's our the delegation. Podcast, the podcast, Lee. <laughs> 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 yeah. I don't know what you're thinking. Um, all right. So let's, let's, I'll take us out. How's that sound? Take us out. Is this podcast brought to us by anybody? Yeah, anybody. Uh, all right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective <laughs> is made possible by svslearn.com, where becoming a great illustrator starts. This new to um, svslearn.com this year, we have the, what is it, Lee? What is the thing that we have new to us? It's a, it's a, a pathway, right? Yes, we've got a curriculum all built out with new classes, new assignments, new energy, new everything. Yep. Uh, um, I took a look at Lee's... Uh, light and shadow class that that he did, and you, I mean, you you made my old light and shadow class look like uh, I don't know, <laughs> look like a second hand, second rate. Um, uh, I don't even know where I'm going with this analogy. Anyways, <laughs> it's good. I loved building that class. It was so much yeah. fun. <laughs> Lee did such a good job with it. So check that out. Um, the 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 track is designed that when you go through all four phases of this track and we're going to be releasing them um, in, in phases and we've got phase one coming out uh, or, or out for this, for this time, this time of year. Um, when you go through them all, you actually have the structure, the pieces needed to make a portfolio. And so that's, that's the idea there is that, um, is that you come away with not just the knowledge, but actual tangible thing that you can show and try to get work. So go check out svslearn.com. And if you, if you enjoy this podcast, if you like what's going on here, subscribe, become a member, get access to over 100 uh, different illustration courses, including our new uh, pathway that we've designed. Your hosts have been Will Terry, Lee White, Jake Parker. My uh, website is... Mr. Jake Parker.com. Lee White's website is Lee White Illustration.com and Will Terry's is Will Terry.com. Podcast is edited by Alex Sugg. You can find his work at alexsugg.com. That's Sugg with two G's. And podcast is produced by Tanner Garlic. And you can find his website at tannergarlicart.com. And our SVS production manager is Aaron Painter. And you can find his work at Aaron or at painterdraws.com. If you like this episode, please share it around. As Lee mentioned, um, we do have a uh, thread on the svs.com, svslearn.com forums about this particular topic. And we'd love to hear what you think, uh, where you disagree with us, where you agree with us, or where we um, totally missed something and, and, and you had something you wanted to add to the conversation. So log on over there. It's free to join and, um, and tell us what you think. All right. I think that's it. Uh, we love you guys. We'll see you next time.